just to recap, um, in the first half, he's been through and we've created a Windows 7 deployment project for Springfield. And we've dealt with the kind of site-specific stuff, so where our workstation is going to be, um, where it's going to get registered in Zenworks, where it's going to be an Active Directory, and our kind of core window settings. So what we need to do now is look at some of the more specific components of how we're going to get applications for our different locations, uh, which will kind of complete then our Windows 7 deployment, and then how we're going to get that deployment out there. So the migration process for all the existing machines, how they're going to get to Windows 7. We're then going to look at disconnected imaging. So this is becoming increasingly um, important for customers to have solutions for different types of locations. And then we're going to finish off with a sneak preview of our new deployment monitoring solution. So this is where the deep gets really, really deep. Application logic rules is something that some of our customers use and understand. Many of our customers are aware that they're there but haven't quite figured out why they need them. So in our scenario here in Springfield, we want a single project, but we want to be able to deploy different applications based on either the location or a department within a location. And we don't want to have to think about that or know about that when we're deploying a machine. And we don't want to have to create different projects because the machine is at a different location. So what we're going to use is the Imaging Toolkit application logic rules. Now, as Heath's already shown you, we can set some things at imaging time. So one of the things we're going to do is to set our department um, in Zim at imaging time. And then we're going to have one installer bundle that deals with all the applications that we're going to need. And then we're going to look at how the rules control what actually gets installed on each machine. So the first thing we look at here, you've, you've already seen some of this. Here's a bit more Zim scripts. We're going to extend the standard Zim form that appears when you image a machine the first time that shows you the hardware information and you can change the computer name. And we're going to add a drop down list for the department. So you'll see here we've got this ENGL depth list variable. And this is something that we created using our any file. So we've got our variable. Heath in part one has read that in and got a Zim variable there that's our list of departments. Once we've Display that, the user will select the department that they want, and then we're going to write that information into ImageSafe data in the same way that we have with all of our other variables for the build process. So this is our form. Here's our custom section here that shows us the department. So in this case, we've de detected the school location, and we've got three different departments within that location that we can select from. Now within our project, we need to go and we need to set a logic rule. So the default logic rule for any imaging toolkit project is going to be something called debug audit only, which kind of does what it says. It will log what you've got, but it won't interact with that process at all. It will just show you the ZCM bundles as ZCM tries to install them. So we're going to set our logic rule to installer and workstation. So what this means is we're going to evaluate the installer bundle, and we're going to look at what's assigned to the workstation. Now, again, using variables that we've already created and stored from our sites.ini file, we're going to add workstations into groups based on their site and their department. So we use two variables here, engl underscore site and engl underscore department. And in the same way as Heath was describing earlier, they will get expanded out when the machine is actually deployed. And so we're going to add this workstation into a group called administration within the school folder. So as you can see, by using variables, we can then define as many sites and as many departments as we want within our sites.ini file. And we don't need to change our project at all. Those settings are in there, and they'll be expanded out during the actual build process. So our installer bundle has every bundle that we might want to install in any location. And as, as many of you will know, you can set the order that you want the bundles to install. So you'll see here we've got a whole heap of bundles that we're going to install uh, at each, could be installed at any location. And we have the ability to control that. Each bundle has continue on failure enabled. And the reason that we do that is that some of these bundles may get blocked by the build process because that machine 
is not supposed to have that application. If we don't tick continue on failure, CCM will detect that the bundle, an action within the bundle has failed and it will stop processing that bundle. So for the purposes of logic rules, we need to make sure that continue on failure is set. What you'll see in the event log for each device is uh, an information message telling you that a certain bundle was blocked and Novell record it as a third party verify event. There is only one third party verify user, as it were, which is ENGL. Um, the facility is there, but I don't believe anybody else uses it. But that's, that's what Novell call it. Uh, we call it logic rules because that's kind of what it means to us in terms of the deployment process. So that's our installer bundle. And then there's quite a lot here, but it essentially hopefully means a fair amount to you. So within our zone, um, we have a school folder for workstations. And then within that folder, we have some workstation groups that represent each department. So at the school level, we've said every machine that builds at the school is going to get, hopefully you can just about see that, the Adobe Flash Player plugin and Firefox. So that's assigned at the school level. Then within the administration group, we've assigned some other bundles. So the administration group will get LibreOffice, the Visio Viewer, and the WebEx Meeting Manager. So by doing this, we can layer up the bundles of the applications that get installed. So we can say the entire site will get these bundles, and each individual administration group will then get some further bundles. So just by way of how this is going to process out, if we're building a student workstation, we haven't assigned anything specifically to students, so that will just inherit from the folder level Firefox and Flash Player. So you see here on our left column for the installer bundle, we have every bundle that can install. And what will happen during the deployment process is that we will evaluate the installer bundle will have a, an application it wants to install, and we'll evaluate whether the student workstation should have that bundle. So if we take Acrobat Reader, that isn't assigned to the student machine at all, so it will be skipped. But Firefox 19 is assigned by virtue of the machine being in the school location and therefore will be installed. So you can see that logic flowing through. The final bundle here, our underscore last app installed bundle, is a flag to the build process to say all the bundles are done. And the reason we have this is that your applications can reboot if they need to, and ZCM will pick up again processing the installer bundle, and when we reach the last app installed flag, at that point we say, okay, all the apps are done and the build process will carry on from there. Now if we look at another workstation, our administration workstation, hopefully you can see this building up. In this case, we have some application bundles that are assigned to the workstation group. So we've got our LibreOffice and Visio and WebEx. So in this case, those bundles will be installed along with the Firefox and Flash Player bundles assigned to the site. So hopefully you start to see that you can build up and layer up the different applications using your ZCM infrastructure and components within ZCM to create a very, very flexible uh, set of options for your deployment. So with one project, one build process, one installer bundle, you can deploy different locations based on whatever criteria you want to define. Now, we're getting to some logs. Hopefully you can follow this through. So in a, in a log, when the machine's actually deploying, the first thing you'll see is this now request. And that should be the underscore installer bundle. That's the first bundle that should fire. And that bundle is assigned to our installer user, and it's assigned to run when the machine refreshes. So in terms of our, our actual deployment process, we will block bundles installing in any phase apart from phase three. So if you remember back to the diagram that we had up earlier that Heath showed you, there's five phases in the build process. We only allow bundles to install in phase three. So our installer bundle will fire on the machine, and then we'll actually go through and we'll say, OK, do we have a logic rule? So in this case, we have a logic rule, and it's set to installer and workstation. So what we'll do is we'll look for all the applications that are assigned to our installer. So this is our underscore installer bundle. 
and then we'll check the dependencies. So you can see here we've got a whole bunch of dependency bundles. This is every bundle that's listed within your underscore installer bundle. And so we've got a couple of bundles here we're going to highlight. We've got Firefox and we've got Flash Player. So they've been detected for the, uh, as dependencies of the installer bundle. We're then going to look at the workstation. So what's happening here on the, on the back end is that the a component within the build process is going off and talking to your ZCM primary server and saying, give me all the bundles that are assigned to this workstation. And it will look at everything from the individual device, the group, folders, right up to the workstation's container. And we end up with a list of all the bundles that that device could possibly have. So in this case, we're building a student workstation. So we've only got these two bundles that we highlighted earlier, Flash Player and Firefox. So then within the process, we end up with a list of two bundles that we want to install. So just to recap here, the installer bundle is going to try and launch LibreOffice, Acrobat Viewer, Visio Viewer, Firefox. And we're going to say, we only want these two bundles in this result list. So the next section you'll see is that the once we've figured out what we want, we allow the installer bundle to start its normal processing. So the first section is the down, it comes up as downloading. This is the distribution phase of a bundle. So we can see here the action is distribute. One of the things that we do is that we want to make sure we only distribute content for bundles we're actually going to install. So we don't want to pull down 300 megs of LibreOffice if we're not going to install it because all it's going to do is sit in the ZCM cache on the machine for 30 days and then get deleted. So we may as well not spend the time caching it in the first place. So you can see here we have a distribute request and it's for LibreOffice. LibreOffice is not in our list, so we block it. So where you see in a log not found in cache returning false, that bundle will not distribute at that point. It will get skipped. Then we, later on we have a further distribute request and this is for Flash Player 11. Flash Player 11 is in our list of applications that we care about, so we're going to allow it to cache. So that process will run through for every bundle that exists in your installer bundle. Once they've all downloaded, the next phase of any ZCM bundle is it starts to install. So the installer bundle says, OK, I've got all my content. I'm now going to install each of the actions in my install action set. And this is your list of bundles. So again, the first bundle in that list is LibreOffice. And exactly the same as before, we say, no, nope, we don't want that. It's not in the list of bundles that we want to allow. So then other bundles will fire in sequence down the list. And then we get to our Firefox bundle. The Firefox bundle has an install action, which we're happy with. We say, yes, that's available in. Um, our list of applications that we care about, so we're going to allow it to install. And then you'll see this section here. So the action set processing is where the actual uh, install step for that bundle is fired. And the key thing to look at here is these timestamps. So if you see a begin and an end, and there's a gap of more than one second in between, there's a good chance that that bundle installed successfully. If all of those timestamps cover about one second, then there's a pretty good chance that bundle failed to install. We've allowed the bundle to install. We're then expecting however you've got that bundle configured for it to work and install. But one of the, the key things and the very powerful things that you can use here is you can test your bundles outside of the build process. So you can play around, configure your bundle, assign it to a test workstation, and make sure that it installs silently with whatever configuration you need and that it, once it's done, that, that bundle actually works correctly. Once you've done that, you can then include it in your installer bundle. The other thing to consider and to remember is dependencies between applications, so the order that you put applications into your installer bundle. And the most critical things typically, typically are things like uh, antivirus or uh, firewall applications that will lock down the network connection. You kind of want those to be last. Because if you have those midway through your installer bundle, there's a pretty good chance they're going to stop the whole process dead in its tracks. 
So there's a, a big element here of know your applications, but hopefully that's giving you a bit more detail on how the processing actually goes through from an imaging toolkit perspective. So once we've got all our bundles configured uh, and everything is set, we've then got a fully automated Windows 7 deployment process that will go from bare metal up to a fully built machine with all the applications for our specified location and our specified site. So the next thing we need to do is we need to look at how we're actually going to roll this out to our various locations within Springfield. Now, Windows 7 migration typically has a number of approaches. Obviously, as you all know by now, Windows 7 is a bit bigger than previous versions, um, and Windows 8 is a bit bigger than Windows 7. So when you get to that, things just keep increasing in size. But typically, there are three approaches that you can use to deploy your automated Windows 7 uh, build process to machines. So the most common one is manual deployment. You physically go to the machine, or you have a build lab where you deploy machines, and then they go to wherever they're going to go. And that can be done over Pixie, Network Boot, or using removable media like USB or DVDs. Now that's fine. If you're doing a large scale, you might use multicast. You might do 100 machines at a time. Um, and so that's a very powerful way of, of rolling out a lot of machines rapidly. You may decide that you're going to get your service desk to uh, assign the upgrade to machines as and when based on some sort of more long-term schedule that you're going to use. So service desk could assign the Windows 7 migration to a device within CCM, and then that process will run through. Uh, and the last one, which we like but makes most people kind of run and hide, is the ability for the user to migrate themselves. This obviously has some caveats around you knowing what hardware they've got and what settings they need and what applications they need. But you can stick a, an icon on their desktop that says migrate me to Windows 7, double click the icon, tell them to go away for a couple of hours, and then when they come back, their machine will be Windows 7 with all our applications and all their settings. As I say, we, we've done this. We did this at BrainShare a couple of years ago in a two-hour session just to prove it could be done. It may or may not be applicable to your environment, but essentially you have the tools within CCM and with Imaging Toolkit. If you want to facilitate that, then those options are there. And the considerations are common to all of these. So you have to know what hardware you've got, user profiles and settings, how much stuff do you need to carry across from Windows XP to Windows 7. Even if you're re-imaging machines um, that break, so you're reapplying a Windows 7 image. What components do you need to carry across? What other infrastructure do you have in place that holds onto those things? And then obviously your applications and how you're going to deliver your applications for Windows 7. So if we have a, look, a quick look at the service desk initiated approach, then you start off, if you're, if you're worried about the user settings, you can use Zenworks personality migration to capture whichever components of, of their machine you care about. You can then use a Zenworks scripted imaging bundle to basically redeploy that machine. So you assign it using ZCM, and then you reboot the machine. And that machine will then kick off Pixie Boot and go through the imaging toolkit deployment process. At the end of that process, when the user logs back in, you can reapply the personality that you captured before you rebuilt the machine. So they get all their settings and their wallpapers and their picture of their dog and whatever else they want will come back with that personality. So from a, a ZCM perspective with an imaging bundle, what you can do is to create a pre-boot bundle. And the pre-boot bundle has an imaging script in it. And this is documented within our standard imaging toolkit documentation. What the pre-boot bundle will do is to run a fragment of your Zim script. And the reason it's a fragment is that we don't want any user interaction in this process at all. So we're going to read in all the information we need from ImageSafe data. So in our Springfield scenario, we're going to read our site and our location, and we're going to read all the department information, everything that we need. So we have all the variables that we need for deployment. And then we're going to restore all the images and reboot the machine. And the machine will then go through its normal automated deployment process, 
Um, and at the end of that process, the machine's ready for the user and they can log back in again. Now, for those of you who think it's a good idea, there's the user initiated. Now, the user initiated relies on that same bundle being there. But what you can do using the Imaging Toolkit ActiveX control is put a very simple script onto the user's desktop. Now, you could expand this, so you could include personality capture before kicking off the imaging job, and you could also include the restore of the personality. If you, if you capture the logged in username, you can use all of that as variables to capture and restore all the settings. But essentially, what we're going to do here is we're going to assign, using the ActiveX control, we have this assign ZCM bundle function. So we tell it the name of the bundle and the type. So in this case, it's a pre-boot bundle. We're going to tell it an object name, which is in our script here comes from the environment. So we're going to expand out the Windows computer name variable. So this will be the name of the device, which will be what the device is called within ZCM. And then we set an object type of device. So what this function does is it assigns the bundle to the workstation, and then it ticks the, the box effectively within ZCM that says there is imaging work to do. And then finally, we're going to reboot the machine. And when we reboot the machine, it's going to go through. It's going to pixie boot. So this is relying on you being able to pixie boot the machine. It's going to detect work to do, pixie boot, and then kick off the deployment process. Now, as I say, there, there are a lot of people who just think this is an incredibly bad idea. But we have customers that do this to facilitate more rapid deployment of Windows 7. Because if you empower the user to do it when they want to, then they can. And the only thing you have to know is what are their application requirements? What do I need to put down onto that build to make sure they don't lose their core business application that they need? Now, we talked, and those scenarios all look at a Pixie-based model of imaging. So being able to Pixie boot a machine on the network and build it. As I mentioned before, we've got a lot of customers now who are very interested in the ability to do disconnected imaging. So in our back to our Springfield scenario, we've got our Burns Manor location that doesn't have any ZCM server, primary or satellite there, no Pixie services. We've just got workstations that we want to be able to manage. So what we're going to look at is the ability to, to build those machines and image those machines from disconnected media. And the most common cases for this are typically either low bandwidth locations or locations where you have no ZCM infrastructure. So you may have just one or two machines on a location. You don't feel it's worth putting a satellite server out there for that small number of machines. But you still want the ability to build them and have them register and be part of your ZenWorks environment. And there's some things that we need to do within our Zim script. So we can have one common Zim script both for the Pixie environment and the disconnected environment. So you're not managing two scripts and two sets of logic. There's a couple of things that we need to do so that we know that this is a disconnected build rather than a connected build. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the actual boot device that was used. So uh, the ZenWorks Linux environment does this for us automatically. It will set a variable of either USB boot or CD boot if you boot from those media. So we're going to try and look for those. And if they're set, we're going to say uh, set a variable called media boot and make that true. And when we look at our actual restore commands, we can check the value of that variable. And if it's true, we're going to change how we run IMG to use restore and local. And then we're going to change our imaging path to be from a USB device. If we don't boot from media, we're going to use our standard restore from proxy. And then the imaging path, we don't need to set because that is automatically our ZCM server. So a, a couple of minor tweaks to your Zoom CFG will allow you to use it in a disconnected manner. We can get a bit cleverer if we need to. And this, at first glance, might look horrific, but it's not as bad as you might think. So in an environment where we don't have DHCP, for example, we just have machines with a static IP address, we can check using a variable that Zim will set called network underscore IP to see if we have an IP address. 
And if we haven't, or it's 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0, we can display a form similar to the other forms we have in Zim that essentially ask for an IP address, a network mask, and a gateway. And all of this stuff here allows us to set a mask so that they can only enter, whoever's deploying this machine can only enter something that looks like a valid IP address. So three numbers, dots in between, um, to try and validate and make sure they don't just type garbage in there. And once we gather that information, we can then run some standard Linux commands to set the address on the machine and then to add a default gateway. So that gives us just an example of some of the things you might need to do in a, in a disconnected environment and the power that you've got within Zim to handle the different network environments that you might have to deal with. So within the Imaging Toolkit, we have uh, what we call the Zim Installer. The Zim Installer allows you to customize the Zenworks Linux environment uh, to do different things, essentially. So the default thing that you've you probably all know, anybody who's used Imaging Toolkit will have seen, is the initRD file um, that Novell provide. We provide a customized version of that that has the integration point for Zim. And that integration point is effectively an extra script that gets run that pulls Zim down from your TFTP server and runs it. Now, there may be other things that you want to do. So you may want to modify some of the Linux settings and add drivers. And then when we get into removable media, we want to do things like either totally disconnected imaging for sites that have nothing on there, or what we call LAN connected, which means we've got an IP infrastructure. Um, so we can get an IP address, and we've got a Zenwork satellite, but the Zenwork satellite doesn't have the images on there. So we need a mechanism to boot up and restore the images locally. And you can also do things like modify the boot image. So instead of the normal Zenworks blue boot image, you can set your own boot image if that's something you want to do. So the Zim installer is a, uh, it comes in a Linux tar file. Um, you need a SLES 11 VM, typically, or a SLES 11 server to run this on. Uh, and the reason for that is that the Zenworks Linux environment is a SLES 11 kernel. So the tools that we need to modify that obviously are there in SLES 11. To extract out the tar file, the Zim installer itself is a Perl script, and the tar file contains a folder structure and some standard components that we need uh, to modify the, Zim, the Linux environment. So things like the splash screen will provide you with a default ENGL splash screen. And then you can add into that structure your Zim files, so the Zim binaries and your project .ini file and your images.ini file and your sites.ini file and then your images. So you can copy your standard ZMG files that you have on the network onto your removable media, and that gives you a totally disconnected imaging solution. So what we're going to do is have a look at just how easy ZimInst is. Hopefully you can see my SLES 11 VM here. So we're going to run ZimInst. So the first thing we do is we'll get prompted for where is our Zenworks media. So in this instance, we either need an initRD file, if we're doing the Pixie environment, or a bootcd.iso file. So we have those in our, by default, the source directory from where we ran Zeminst. We can specify network drivers. So these are pre-compiled .ko files these days uh, for any network cards that aren't supported in Zenworks. Now, typically, this is isn't used so much these days because Novell push out their monthly imaging updates, but Zimins has been around for quite a long time. So if you go back a few years, lots of customers were compiling their own network drivers because they couldn't wait for Novell to release a patch. These days, the monthly updates cover most people quickly enough that they don't need to do it. We specify a target folder. So this is where we're going to push out whatever media we're going to create. So in this case, we're going to actually going to create a boot CD so that I can show you it booting and then a temporary folder. And this is where ZimInst will do all of the work that it needs to do. So we pick a version of Zenworks. And we then, so in this case, we're going to do 11.2.3. We can enable a custom boot splash image. So I'm going to do that. And 
by default, this is the uh, ENGL splash screen that we'll see. And I said you can copy your own images in there. You have to remember this is a boot splash image, so there are some limitations in terms of the Linux kernel environment. So typically, you're looking at an 800 by 600 image and no greater than 16-bit color depth. So we've seen customers who have some fantastic 32-bit high-res graphic, and the boot splash environment will effectively say, I can't do that, and just not display anything. So you have to keep your images pretty basic, really, for the boot splash side of things. We have the option to add new hardware IDs. So if you have a specific hardware ID uh, for new network cards that Novell don't have yet, but the driver works, then you can add that in here. We don't need to do that for this scenario. And then we can select the media that we want to use. So in this case, we're going to do a CD-ROM. And we're going to say we're totally disconnected. So we're not, we haven't got a TFTP server or any other form of server to restore our images from or get any files from. We've got the option to say, is there DHCP? So we'll say, yeah, we've got DHCP. We can set an address for the imaging server. Now, if you don't care, you can just set this to the local loopback address. But it may be that you want to restore some images from the local media and some images from the server. And then we specify where are our CMG files, so where are our images, and where are our ZIM binary files. So we'll leave those at the default, and we'll kick this off. So what ZimInst will do is it will take the boot CD, it'll open that up, modify the initRD file to add in the components for Zim, and it will recompress that, and then it will recreate the boot CD.ISO with all of the components that we've added in. Now, obviously, with image files these days, if you've got a Win 7, 32, and 64-bit image, then you're going to hit the limit of what you can do with an ISO. So you then get into using USB media and having all of your images on a USB stick instead of uh, a DVD, for example. And that's what we've seen more and more is that people are using USB pen drives for this. So as you can see here, we've, we've written out a new boot CD. So I've got a second virtual machine here. And this is going to power up using that boot CD that we just created. So it boots from the CD. You can see we've got a custom splash screen here. And in the background, we've got our normal Zenworks Linux environment booting up. So this is all coming off our boot CD. Um, nothing, there's no network activity here. So we'll just let this spin up. It may or may not get an IP address, depending on which VM network I've got it connected to. So again, this is something if you're, if you're using fully disconnected imaging and you have some sites with DHCP and some sites without, you may see a delay on the sites without while it figures out what to do. And then we're into Zim. So we can see here we've got our restore menu as normal. We've got our Windows 7 build. And we've got a Windows 8 build, which could be in development. And then we have our normal Zim form. This is our new machine. We can set the asset tag, and we can pick our department as for our requirements for application delivery. I'm sure all of you are very familiar and don't desperately need to see Zenworks imaging, so we won't go any further with that. But as you can see there, that gives you the ability then to have a fully disconnected Zenworks environment on a USB pen drive. So we have some customers working with recently who have about 50 gigs worth of images. So they have a, they clone out these USB pen drives with the Linux environment and the images on there. And then they have deployment engineers who can just run around. So for our scenario, a deployment engineer can go off to Mr. Burns Manor and deploy any machines there that we need to deploy with Windows 7. So the final part of our presentation today, and this is some new things that we're working on, is the ability to actually monitor what's going on with your deployments. Any of you who've seen Imaging Toolkit will know that the deployment process is very regimented. It has a set number of phases and tasks that it performs. And what we want to do is give you the ability to 
be able to see what's going on effectively in your environment and if you've got lots of sites and lots of machines building on a daily basis to actually be able to monitor that. So what you're going to be able to do within Build Console is to specify a monitor server. So this will be a Windows box running IIS and SQL Express in the first release that you can add in. And once you've added it in, both Zim and the main run, so the build process and the imaging environment will know about it and will send updates to it. So the plan is that we're going to send updates before and after imaging, so before imaging starts and when it's finished, and then before and after phases one, two, three, and four. So you'll have a good idea of where machines are, how they're building, if they get stuck. If they error for any reason, then we'll also record that, so you'll be able to see if a machine triggers the on error functionality within Imaging Toolkit, you'll see that pop up as an error. So the process essentially is also designed to be a very wide area network friendly, so it's all using HTTP, there's no funky port requirements going on. So a machine that's building will send status updates to the monitoring server, and then you as an administrator will be able to view both the current machines building and the historical view of machines that have built. This is a mock-up of what the monitoring is going to look like, so you'll be able to see the type, manufacturer model of machine, the name, and the deployment phase and sort of total progress. And then you'll be able to set that to auto-refresh. So that would be a live view, and then we'll have a historical view that shows you machines that built in the last five days, for example. So this is something that we're working on at the moment. Our guys are using it to, to see, just for testing purposes, what's going on. And it's something we're aiming to release. I won't be any more committal in the second half of this year. I know we've already started the second half of this year, but it gives you a rough idea of what we're aiming for. So that's all from us. But on behalf of Heath and myself, we'd like to thank you very much for your time today, and I hope you found the session useful. Thanks very much, guys.